The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the home for Autism Live. It is also the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. We're thrilled to be here with you on this Wednesday morning. You know, we got a new format, one hour, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, so, and you know, Wednesday is my favorite day, honestly, because we, a lot of times we have we have great people, let's say that. A lot of times we have Dr. Doreen Grampichet here live. She's not gonna be with us live, but I've got somebody else who's gonna be answering your questions live, and we've never had her in this format. So don't go anywhere, because this is gonna be super fabulous, awesome. Um, I would start singing supercalifragilistic, but you know there'd probably be some sort of fee we'd have to pay for that, plus, uh, my singing voice is unique, let's say that. In any case, uh, thrilled to be here with you this morning. And I want to remind you that throughout the next hour, we will be live and we love your interaction, your feedback. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying, you guys, to be better because I, my ability to walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time is somewhat challenged, right? But I'm going to try to keep track of, as you guys are writing in comments on the different sites, a little bit tighter today. Uh, okay, so uh, Traven's going to show you some of the different ways that you can connect with us. And while he does that, I want to remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. That is our brand new website is up there on that. By the way, if you want to go to the old site because you liked it better the old way, then you would just do... Uh, old autism hyphen live.com um, and then you could watch it there as well but I really prefer the new site and I'd love to hear from you guys if you do as well uh, we moved things around a little bit so it looks a little bit more like a like a Netflix or a Hulu kind of situation that there are playlists and you can scroll through them through them but there is a search feature at the top that if you want to search by topic you just type in the word if you prefer to search by text, um, you can. there's a thing up at the top that says search by topic and you click on that. And if you push the Ask Dr. Doreen, it will allow you uh, to search by topic. And so let's say you put in toilet training and that's my favorite one. I don't know why I always use that example. Uh, you put in toilet training and it will show you all the videos where Dr. Doreen has asked been asked a question and answered a question about toilet training and it will tell you the text of the question so you can see oh that one's about an adult toilet training this one's about a three-year-old this one's about when you're having sleep uh, toilet training problems right so you can be more specific and when you click on the title of the question it brings you right to that day that timestamp of when she's answering the question which I love uh, in any case the chat is now at the bottom and if you want it to go big on your screen, you just hit the, the live and it will do that. So we appreciate you guys being here with us. I always like to remind you when I have an opportunity that we have guests on the show that are experts. I'm not one of them. I, am an, I have an informed opinion. This is my new thing that I like to say. I have an informed opinion. Um, having been covering autism topics for over a decade now, um, I've gotten to interview a lot of people and I do think that I have an informed opinion, but that's all it is, y'all. Um, I've, I've been spending so much time with people from the South, so I've adopted the y'all. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm here because I got lucky, and I want you to get lucky. And when I say you, I mean the entire autism community in the biggest, biggest, most beautiful sense. 
uh, whether you're the person who's on the autism spectrum or you're the parent or you're the practitioner or you're the grandparent or the aunt or the uncle, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, I think what we all have in common is that we care deeply about people who are on the autism spectrum getting the respect and the help and support that they need to live the lives that are meaningful to them, right? I think that's what it's all about. We can disagree about everything else under the sun, but I think we're all in agreement about that. So um, that's why I'm here, because I got lucky and I had the opportunity to help my son. And I've also had the opportunity to provide support to others along the way as a result of that. And that makes me really happy. And that's what I want to do for you. So I offer a hand. We hold hands. We get through this together. Si se puede, right? We absolutely can do this. We've been doing this for a while. And um, for those of you who are new to this, I want you to know that there are a lot of us who've been through this and survived and thrived. So come with us, join and take what's useful to you, write in, tell us what you need, because it's not one size fits all. Uh, I don't think much in life is. Uh, it isn't even one size fits most, right? So write into us and we'll be happy to do what we can. It's important that you tell us where in the world you are so that we get a sense of what resources might be close to you. And by the way, please, uh, I'm, I'm opening up the Facebook so that I can be uh, keeping track and we'll also be looking at the live feed as well. But I mentioned that uh, we don't have Dr. Grampy Shea today. We will have her next week. So if you're writing on your calendar, and of course we'll send out a postcard on Monday. You know, when you're on our site and that thing pops up that says, would you like to subscribe? That's what the reason why you should subscribe is you'll get the postcard uh, at the beginning of the week telling you who's on the show, including Dr. Grampy Shea. But we do have her next week. This week, instead of Dr. Grampy Shea, because, uh, you know, it's always it's like, oh, no, we don't have Dr. Grampy Shea. So I like to get you guys somebody uh, that's you know, fabulous, right? Why, why would I want to give you less than fabulous? A lot of times we have uh, Evelyn Kung uh, here to answer questions, but today we're having Sue Cho. Now, Sue has not been on the show a lot, but whenever I can get her on the show, I love to have her on the show. She is an amazing expert in the field of autism, and, and you're going to love her. So we're going to take a short break so that we can get Sue connected on the Skypeage. And then we're going to have a great time answering your questions. So be writing them in right now. Stick with us. We'll be back after these messages. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living, the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life, including self-control, planning, and problem solving, effective communication, performing life skill tasks, for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish. Learn. Become.
and say hello. Say hello. AJ. Stop crying. <laughs> AJ, let's eat. Can you eat, AJ? Let's eat, son. Have a fry. My understanding of autism was very limited. He would lick tires on cars, windows, you, you name it. And so we went to the 13 month checkup and I remember our pediatrician he said, well, he probably has autism. There's nothing you can do about it. Come back in a year when he's three. Our initial understanding of what the ABA program was was basically all we picked up from this clinic in San Antonio. He didn't pick up any signs the entire eight months that he was there. I think the difference came when we changed vendors. We were very impressed with the way that Card actually gathered data to be able to quantify the progress that he was making. They have a curriculum that they follow that's tailored to each child. They were identifying AJ's strengths and weaknesses. We were finally starting to see real progress. What about AJ? Here's the head. The first thing Card did for us is I remember he said, Mommy, AJ said, Mommy, I want you. And that was the most wonderful thing ever. There's, so there's hope. Yeah, there's that's when I knew that there was hope. I never thought that AJ would be able to say that. It was like a gift from God. It was so fantastic. With Card, we got him enrolled in a private school. And he was in a typical classroom. He would go from activity to activity. He could sit when he was supposed to sit. He could be around typical kids. The goal is for Card to work themselves out of a job. It's for AJ to be in a mainstream classroom with no help, and he's functional and he's learning. We're really grateful for all of the things. AJ would not be where he is without them, and we will never be able to repay them. The part of himself that they gave to him to make his life better and to make our lives better. To Autism Live, and our special guest this morning is Sue Cho, and she is joining us on Skype right now. Sue has been on the show before, but never in this exact format. And there she is live. You were seeing a picture of her before. Hey, Sue. Hello. We're so thrilled to have you on. Uh, for people who don't know you, Sue, I mean, I'm going to say a little bit about what I know about you, but then you tell us what your job description is at CARD, because I know it's changed so many times over the year. But I just want to say that I, whenever I have... Uh, there's a whole host of issues that if I have, Sue is the expert that I run to. Um, I, anytime that there's something about someone needing functional communication and um, needing to learn how to use an iPad or PEX or whatever, when there's an issue with communication, I run to Sue. When I need ideas about something that's difficult, to teach an individual, I run to Sue. Sue has been working in this field for how many years, Sue? 25 years. 25 years. And, and someone who for years flew all over the world, and I do mean the world, to meet with families, train teams for families, come back and check on kids. She's really brilliant, and now her role at CARD is, is, as I see it, but I'm gonna have you explain, is helping to disseminate all the wonderful things that she knows. I don't know anybody who cares more than Sue. Um, so she is a real heart for our families and for our kiddos. But there's something about her that the minute she's in a room, things get better always. There's something aura-wise. And I haven't even talked about the fact that she's a yoga master and, and teaches our kids yoga that helps them with self-regulation and dealing with all the things that they have going on. So I adore the ground that Sue walks on, and I think she knows that. And my kid adores the ground that she walks on. So um, anyway, that's. But w tell them what your actual job title is at CARD now, Sue. Okay, thanks, Janet. Um, and actually, last month was my 23rd year at CARD. Wow. So I was a independent therapist for a family in the Washington, D.C. area before I was hired by CARD. And um, my title at CARD is Senior Clinical Trainer. And so I provide 
uh, training and mentorship to all the supervisors that come into CARD, uh, either who are new BCBAs or new BCABAs that are either um, that have been at CARD for a while or are new to CARD too. So that's my primary job now. Wow. Um, and and how lucky are we that she's doing that because to to disseminate all that she knows to all those people, it's a really good thing, you guys. So we asked Sue to come in this morning and fill in for us answering some questions. And um, you guys can be writing in your questions, but I'm going to take a couple that we haven't been able to get to first. So I'm going to start with uh, this mom writes in, and we have a lot of moms who... Uh, because we don't say people's names on the show, we sort of give them names so that it's code that we know. Like we have the strawberry mom and we have the haircut mom and we have, so this is the O mom. And she writes in and says, my son is eight and a half. I feel like they are not pushing him enough at school. They keep saying his comprehension and inferencing is what he is at deficit at. But yet every time we test him, he does fine. And he is amazing at math. He is in an inclusion class. I just feel like they are holding him back. Are there special schools that can push him? What do you think about STEM schools or magnet schools? I just feel so bad that he's stuck. Also, what is the best way to teach him religion? His twin is going to have her first communion this year, and he is not. Every time I try to tell him, he asks literal questions, and she sends our love to all of us. So that, there are a lot of questions in there, Sue. Where do you want to start? I have it in front of me, too. So if I'm Good. looking down, it's because I'm referencing the question to make sure that I don't miss anything. So I'd say that um, when they're saying that he's having difficulty with comprehension and inferencing, um, I'd probably try to find out what specifically they are using in reference to that. Because, I mean, if he's got a strength in math, I mean, does he have more difficulty with things like word problems, for example? And also, you mentioned that when they're testing him, he's testing well. Again, but what are they testing him on specifically? I think that if you have more information about the specifics rather than generally speaking, that it might help you guide them in um, challenging him more. Um, I'm guessing that he has an IEP, and... Um, meeting with the IEP team and uh, providing more specifics on areas that he needs more support on or where they feel that he needs support on could really benefit how he is uh, excelling and, and succeeding in other areas too, especially because he is already excelling in math. So that's outstanding. And you mentioned that he's in inclusion. Um, once again, referring to the IEP, it would really help to know what types of supports they have in place for him in the inclusion environment, because I find that with a lot of individuals that are on the spectrum, that um, you really want to set out specific goals for what the expectations are of your son, so that you can all be on the same page in terms of um, giving him the push that he needs, like you said, for him to succeed and also have a nurturing environment that allows him to reach his fullest potential. There are absolutely good schools for uh, STEM and also Magnet. Again, it's really going to depend on the structures that they have in place for your son's individual needs. And so, although I don't want, I, I don't want to be big, I think that there are lots of things that need to be addressed in terms of goal setting and also um, what systems can be put in place to help your son succeed and reach his fullest potential. And then the other thing about religion, I found that with a lot of families that I've worked with where they are trying to teach religion to their child that's on the spectrum, that coming up with concrete examples to compare to might also help in terms of the communion. However, I think that frequently my experience has been that our, a lot of our kids, because they're such concrete thinkers, 
that's why religion might be more difficult because a lot of it to them may be in the more abstract. Um, I actually tried to look up some books that might be a good way to illustrate this, and I wasn't able to find any right at, um, when I got these questions, but I am actually, I'm certain from having worked with other families around this that parents were able to find books that were geared towards teaching religion to younger children that helped in explaining things in a more concrete manner too that might be able to help your child. And it's funny, you know, I kind of looked too uh, when I saw this question and one of the things that we found over and over and over again on this show is that the Christian community hasn't quite caught up um, to where... You know, I, I could find eight books that uh, had to do with Judaism uh -huh. that were about um, inclusion and faith from both sides, how to how to teach the people in um, the synagogue to uh, relate to people who have different abilities, right? Uh -huh. And also from the point of view of the person coming into the synagogue, what are some things that you'll you'll do and what and and lessons? Um, so there's all that with Judaism. But the Christian community tends to be just, I don't know why, a little bit uh -huh. behind. Maybe somebody who's listening will take that and decide to write the book because I couldn't find it either, to be honest with you. And I don't know why that is, but it clearly needs to be addressed. Um, so there you have it. I don't, I'm, I don't really have an answer um, from a book either. But it's funny that that was my instinct, too. There's got to be a book, right? Uh -huh. I didn't find it. That's true. Somebody... I think, um, some of the other families that I've worked with in the past, though, have used books that were related to things like death, for example. Yeah. As, you know, from, um, from a Christian standpoint for, for children, for younger children. Oh, to good. To help convey, I guess, some of the pieces of religion to someone that would be more more of a concrete thinker. There we go. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Now, going back to the the deficits on the comprehension and the inferencing, I'm just going to throw in here too, Sue, that I find that um, especially as the children get older, it seems like the teachers don't aren't aren't front loaded with those tools. So if the teacher, like you can write it into the IEP, but if the teacher doesn't know how to address that, is there any place in particular, like does skills have lessons in them that you would recommend for a parent to give to a teacher? Or is there an IBT training that you're aware of that a te would help a teacher to work on inferencing and, and um, comprehension? I do, that's actually, perfect that you bring that up because the first thing that I thought of was going to lessons from skills and again I think for me oftentimes if I have a question I have other questions about the question which will help me give clearer information um, definitely getting examples from the teacher though on what the areas of concern are or where the student is struggling would really help um I guess identify where to teach from too though yeah so i mean is it that you know what is it about the inferencing that's not working i mean i'm assuming from an academic standpoint so usually one of the places that i'm able to identify potential problems would be uh for someone with um difficulty with inferencing for example is if we looked at word problems for example with math Okay, so if her son is doing well in math, is he also doing well with word problems? Mm. That's, That's usually awesome. a place for a lot of our kids that struggle with inferencing, that they struggle, is when there's more of a language arts component to the math itself. I mean, uh, so that's a place to look. Also, too, is it from a writing standpoint? Is it from a reading standpoint? Is it from a social standpoint? So really all of those areas, getting more examples, would help identify where things need to be taught. And um, some of it could actually be through the language curriculum and skills. Some of it could also be through the social curriculum or also the cognition curriculum, too. Okay. So it really depends on the specific problems, which would identify which area to attack it from. Okay. And I just, uh, for those of you who are coming to the show for the first time, what we're talking about, skills and IBT. So it's skillsforautism.com. Great tool. Eight 
uh, different curricula areas that, that Sue is talking about here. You can sign up and do a 14-day uh, free top trial, but they will charge your card on the 15th day, so make sure you're aware of that. Uh, so skillsforautism.com. And then IBT is ibehavioraltraining.com. It has wonderful training modules in three different uh, specific areas. So if you're, you can decide which level you want to do them. There, there's a, a set that's just for parents, which means the jargon is low. And then there's a set for educators that it's just things that happen in the classroom, um, which is amazing. And then there is another set for people who are working individuals on the autism spectrum. So if you're a really on it parent who knows the jargon and wants to know the high level stuff, you can choose for yourself. They don't determine it for you. You choose for yourself. It's very inexpensive, um, cheaper than buying a book. Um, and it's a video that's interactive and even, you know, will quiz your knowledge to see did you did you get what the they were trying to teach you. So ibehavioraltraining.com. Uh, Traven has it up on the screen. Thank you so much, Traven. Okay, we should take a break. And then when we come back, we'll uh, do the next question. I know you guys are writing some things in on Facebook as well. Uh, so don't go anywhere. We're going to be back after these messages. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get right. Hi, welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman. Uh, we're here doing allergy-free cooking, and I brought my sister with me today. Jamie Davis, thanks and for having me. A lot of people are asking about a allergy-free breakfast, and breakfast can be full of crap. You know, it, breakfast, but it's full of cereal. crap, and it's hard to do. We yeah. don't have time in the morning. We're in a hurry. We're going completely nut-free. The recipe is not personality. Good. We can't do yeah, anything can't about. Yeah, can't do anything about that. So we're going to start off first with um, I'm using sorghum and brown rice flour. It, I find the texture good, and I've added some flaxseed meal. We talked about that last time. Flaxseed meal for poop. Almost every one of our kids has a poop issue. What's next on the recipe is the quinoa flakes, baking powder, cinnamon, and the xanthan gum. It brings the glutinous texture back into the flour. And often, what happens with these recipes is they can fall apart. This one holds up nicely. I like it. For the folks that are egg free, we have a ton of egg replacers. One of those can be the arrowroot starch or bringing back some additional flax seeds. So there's a lot of options to go eggless, but we're going to go egg full in this one. For sweetener, I use the maple syrup. I stay away from refined sugar. What I'm adding now is the coconut. Um, milk, maple syrup, and a little bit of the coconut oil. And we're going to add in the raisins, craisins, and chocolate chips at the end. To find that chocolate chips can coax people to eat some really amazing things. When we started, Jeff had 42 food allergies, so we had to get creative in how we cooked. So nuts were a big, big issue. What I like now is that he can tolerate so many more things after we start doing this diet. So let me show you how you can deal with this um, sticky stuff here. You get your fingers really wet, and you can push it down. So my oven has been preheated. It's at um, 350 degrees. So we're going to just throw this in. Like I said, I like it around 23 minutes. And the magic oven says, I'm done. Looks like. Don't you love magic ovens? Yeah. They're awesome. Here we go. Pops right out. The texture of these, and it's so pretty. It looks almost like a big chocolate chip cookie, but you actually made it healthy. But you can be my guinea pig. Tell me what you think. It looks really good. Doesn't it? So the textures and the colors in there are just beautiful. So the raisins are for you, the chocolate chips are for your kid. I can't believe it's gluten free. I know, right? It doesn't taste like, you know, crap. crap. <laughs> <laughs> We're wrapping up another cooking show. If you have feedback, you can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. We're, of course, on Facebook. You could go to facebook.com slash autism live. And of course, Taka Now has thousands of recipes. Join me there, and we can um, cook some more later on. So thanks for joining us. I, we were both saying how great that looked and how much we want to eat that. Uh, we're here with the amazing Sue Cho, and i um, so thrilled that she's here answering your questions today. We are live. Um, so we had a question that came in on Facebook. Somebody asked, 
Our four-year-old is in the process of an assessment for ASD in the Canada area. Uh, very specific area of Canada, but I'm not going to say. Many people are saying that our son can't be autistic as he seeks social interaction. He has many other difficulties that fit with ASD criteria and his OT and SLP agree our son can't maintain social relationships because of his sensory issues and difficulty with pragmatic language. Although he desires and is excited by social interaction, he has a difficult time with it. Can you clarify uh, if some children can be social seeking and have ASD? So what do you think, Sue? definitely have seen many children over the years that may have even been diagnosed late or their diagnosis was difficult to obtain because they were social or it appeared that they had enough social skills to not be considered on the spectrum. Now, I, I, although I don't know this little boy personally, um, I would definitely say get him checked out. Um, I know that lots of parents come in, though, and say, my son's social, so he can't be on the spectrum. But they were able to get a diagnosis, or they got a diagnosis later, because people assume since he was somewhat social, the child was somewhat social, that they couldn't possibly be on the spectrum. But I've definitely seen a fair number of kids that are social, but um, maybe they have it, I guess, they have some social skills, but then perhaps when they spend more time with with people, then more of the deficits start showing up in the social area. Thank you so much for saying that. And I apologize because at the beginning of the show, I usually give the disclaimer and say that whenever we have experts on the show, they cannot give individual specific advice. And Sue reminded me of that when she said, I don't know this little boy. Um, because it, it would be a disservice to an individual to say that writing in a question, you know, that they could have individual specific advice. So the, you're, all that we're able to do here is ask experts to comment in a general nature on the questions that you answer. And then hopefully that helps you to go back to the experts that you have and, and be a little bit further on in the asking questions sequence so that you can get more done. So, so we appreciate you being um, so clear on that, Sue, and I want to be clear too that that's our disclaimer always. And I wanted to say too, uh, you know, I appreciated your answer, Sue, because my son, you know, I think part of the issue that we had um, was that people would say to us, oh, he can't be on the spectrum because he likes being around other kids. Well, you know, I, I over the years, um, since my son has been diagnosed, the criteria for autism changed. Um, but even even before it changed, we it was so it was too much for us to get our heads around but like once a month i would read through it and go oh this makes a little bit more sense now or i'd get just one more piece of it and and i think it's important to note it because a lot of times the information that's out there in the world that comes back to us to tell us about autism isn't correct like we will hear all the time that people with autism don't have any empathy, that they don't have any feeling for other people. And, and I know that's not true. I think it's just the way it filters to people because some people, a lot of people on the autism spectrum have a problem with perspective taking. So they don't know when another person is hurt. Um, and it's the same thing with the communication thing because um, in, in the diagnosis, it, no matter which one you're looking at, it talks about deficits in social skills, but that doesn't mean that you don't want it. And, and, you know, let's remember always too, that people on the spectrum are their own people and they're not, I love the phrase, if you've met one person on the autism spectrum, you've met one person on the autism spectrum. So I appreciate your answer, Sue. And I just want to say to this mom you know, it's so hard when people who aren't experts chime in with their opinion and it can really derail you sometimes. So I want to congratulate you on the fact that you're still going and getting um, the assessment, that you're still following through, that you're asking the question because there's no harm in asking the question, but I love that you're still taking action on it. And that the two people who would know that they're currently on your team that might know a little bit about autism, the OT and the SLP are in agreement with you. But you know, your mother-in-law always has something to say, right? And so 
Like, or, or your friend who lives down the street who has never worked with children on the autism spectrum, but she tells you what she thinks you should do. And they mean well. Let's be honest. They mean well. But they don't know. So you just heard from Sue that absolutely um, that could be the case. And I certainly saw that in our case. Uh, my son would, he would see other kids. He was an only child and he would see other kids and he would run towards them and be so excited. But then when he would get there, he had no idea what to do with them. I, but he wanted them to do things with him. And so sometimes he would do things that were really inappropriate to try to get their attention and to try to get them to play with them. Um, and thank goodness he got good quality ABA that taught him how to interact with other people, how to engage with other people, because my kid is a social butterfly, was then and is now. Just didn't know how to do it now because of good ABA. He does know how to do it, which is a really wonderful thing. Uh, okay. So I'm going to move on to this other question. How does therapy change with age? Our six-year-old high-functioning son was maxed at 10 hours a week for ABA plus two hours of speech and two of OT. I don't really count hours at school because they happen automatically. What should I be looking at next or do I continue these forever and thanks? So um, I'd say that for any child that's in a program in, in doing therapy aba therapy for example every six months or actually even every month really um their supervisors are or their bcbas are frequently looking at what's the direction that we need to be going in now and um what do we need to modify so perhaps it for a, a child at six who is doing well at school on their own um I mean, if, if your, your child is functioning well and doesn't need a lot of support in the school setting, perhaps the 10 hours a week might be spent doing um, more catch-up, depending on what the needs are. Um, again, I'd say that over time, though, we really look at it hard for sure. We're looking at, we're, I always say to families and to therapists, we're working our way out of a job. Because we're really making sure that the child is learning from their own environment, they're able to learn from their peers, from school, so that uh, we've hopefully caught them up or are catching them up so they can be more and more self-sufficient. Um, so I'd say make sure that you speak to your program supervisor, your BCBA, to make sure that you talk about the plan for phase out when that is appropriate. And um, just making sure that you're hitting all the best areas or the most important areas for your child so that he can get the best quality treatment and also phase that out when it's no longer needed. And, and Sue, I don't know about you, but um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm spreading the message here on the show. It worries me that um, she says he was maxed out at 10 hours. And, yes. and I want to know, is that because the insurance said that or the other funding source said that or did the supervisor say that? Because if it's that the supervisor feels like your child needs more than 10 hours, mm -hmm. please know and please spread this word to everybody that you can appeal their decision of how many hours if your insurance or your funding source says, well, we think it should be 10 hours and your, your expert of record has made a recommendation for more, please appeal that and please know that almost all initial appeals fail. But a lot of appeals, if there's merit, and if your person of record, your expert says they need more, a lot of appeals on the second appeal uh, get overturned. And I think that's information that we need to say almost on a daily basis because a lot of people don't know. Um, when they do appeal and they get the initial no and they're like, well, I guess there's nothing I can do. Um, but if you feel and if your expert feels that 10 hours is enough, then that's fine. But please don't allow insurance to dictate to you when your person is saying otherwise. Are you seeing some of that too, Sue? I would say that definitely you, we're, we're seeing that, like what you described, um, with uh, our clients hearing from the funding sources that they're maxing out on how much they've received um, 
And I think that as more families hopefully appeal that, they will start looking more on um, or making decisions based on what's necessary versus a policy. Yeah. And, and also, I guess since we're, and I didn't mean this to turn into an insurance conversation, but, you know, sometimes it does. Um, the, I hadn't thought about it because the way you said max, uh, I was like, oh, yeah, uh, we should definitely talk about the Mental Health Parity Act, which is a federal law, which overrides any of your state laws. And that law says that if somewhere in your policy they al allow for something else, um, for a different condition than autism to get this service, then they can't limit it for autism. What we see is that a lot of times for autism, they'll put uh, a, a number of hours max on it, or they'll put an age max on it. And if you, please check to make sure, um, and they're, if you're a card client, please call card, because we, we, we can look at things and see. But if you um, can show that it's in the policy for something else, it's absolutely illegal for them to max you because of age or hours. Um, and we're finding that a lot of people are winning uh, when they say and uh, on their appeal, Mental Health Parity Act. Uh, and we can actually help you with the verbiage of that um, as well. I think I, sh I need to do a whole show on that at some point. You know, uh, Shannon, you brought up a good point, too, though, about I think people are often afraid to ask because it's, it may be a no. And yeah. I encourage parents to ask, and the answer might be a no. Because if we don't ask, we don't know. That's we'll true. Find out. That is That is so zen. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so we've had somebody who wrote in and said, can you talk about the Card Academy? And we had had another question that I didn't put on the list that was about, um, basically about Card Academy. So I sort of lumped them together. We have several people who are wanting to know what that is, what it looks like, what, sure. what, what that can be. Okay, so to my knowledge, there are Card Academies in Virginia and Arizona. And so the model is that it's very much like a public school, not a public school, pardon, a private school. And um, basically, they have a BCBA on site. They also have licensed special education teachers. And all the children that attend the academies are receiving one-to-one -one intervention. A large portion of the, the students that attend academies are also there because of school district placements. So for example, the first academy that was started in Alexandria, Virginia, was uh, started by the superintendent of our car academies, Marianne Castle. And um, basically, one of the reasons why she felt very strongly about starting academies was that the school systems didn't have a strong alternative place, uh, excuse me. They did not have a, a strong replacement for uh, autism classrooms or autism classes that were ABA. And so uh, she started the first academy, goodness, I think maybe five years ago, maybe longer. And um, now there are three academies, one in Alexandria, one in Stafford, Sterling area, Virginia, and then also near Phoenix in Arizona. But it's, uh, they have multiple classrooms of varying ages. So children are placed in classrooms based on age and, and um, ability. And so each class has a teacher and each student then has a one-to-one -one behavioral therapist with them as well. And, you know, I, I want to say this too, that, um, if you're not in those areas and you're wanting a card academy, the reason why those card academies sprang up where they were was because there were parents who wanted them. Uh -huh. So like everything else with card, if card is not where you want it to be, um, there's a pathway for it to be there and it's always driven by parents. It's not like card sits and goes, hmm, where should we go? And strategically says, okay, you know, we'll go here. Card goes where parents ask them to go. Mm -hmm. So if you want a card academy, card academies were started first by one parent saying it's not working at school, as you were saying, and, and so it starts and then another parent goes, it's not working for us too, and then it builds into an actual building of its own. But we do, even though there are just the three academies that are standalone, we have many clients and other offices that are doing something that's kind of a homeschool program at card. 
Um, so the, the parents work with the school district to have a homeschool program and it's delivered at card by specific people who are therapists and their teachers. Um, so even if you're not in one of those three areas and you're specifically interested in your child being educated in an enriched in ABA environment, um, you know, there, there is a path to that. And I would strongly um, urge you to, um, you can contact me and I'll put you in, in uh, with the right people at CARD depending on where you are. And, and it's a year round school. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and I know our academy parents just love uh, the academies and, and what's happening at them, which is a really fabulous thing. Uh, so uh, I want to take a break and then we'll come back to answer more questions. We're, we're getting down to the end here. So uh, stick with us, though. We're going to be back after these messages. Don't go away. Hard times lead to good choices. Many times you're going to find out that change is coming and it's not something that you like to see. Things sometimes just don't work. Sometimes you have to put your child in a new school. Sometimes you have to put them in a different classroom. Often you'll see this with perhaps special education versus regular education or everyone's favorite, puberty. All bets are off then. However, these things happen when they need to happen. So making that hard choice is super, super scary. But when you open those doors to look at things that maybe you've never dreamed you would have to look at, you're going to find help that you never expected. There are a lot of people out there dealing with the same things that you are dealing with, and there is a level of help that you never even knew existed. So don't be afraid when it's time to look at the scary problems that you're having. When those things come up, when the aggression increases, when things are falling apart at home, when you're getting the calls from the schools, don't be afraid. Reach out. Find out what you need to do. You might need to look at new schools, new housing. You might need to access new levels of service. But I am telling you, you're going to see amazing things. There are children that, as they grow, do things with the help of others, very specialized support that you never thought they could do. So once you do that and you meet the child where he or she is and you give them what they need, everybody can do better and you're going to see amazing progress. Parent to parent, you might be asking yourself sometimes, why does my child have meltdowns? Well, the difference between tantrums and meltdowns, tantrums, they're a part of typical development, but meltdowns are when things get a little bit more out of control, when even the child isn't sure what's entirely wrong. Generally with a meltdown, there's an environmental component. There's something else going on outside the child that's making the tantrum worse. It's really important that we start to be detectives and take notes and look around at the environment and start to figure out what are the things that happen every time your child has a meltdown. And lastly, it's important to get help. You really can't face these kinds of things effectively completely on your own. Tantrums, they're a part of typical development, but don't accept meltdowns as something that just happens. Make sure you get help and support. You might be asking yourself if your child has autism. Welcome back. We are here with Sue Cho. We were just ooing and aahing over that picture of my son. His kindergarten teacher every year, would she had um, a shawl um, and, a, and a lady's hat um, that she would give kids and her husband's suit coat jacket and hat that she would give the boys. And those are the pictures that she would take and send home for Mother's Day. If you guys are looking for something to do for mothers, man, there's nothing better than that, right? To see your little one dressed up in adult clothes holding flowers for you, stop it. I mean, just stop. I can't even, right? Uh, but anyway, we're here with Sue Cho, and she's an amazing expert in the field of autism. She's answering your questions. 
We had somebody from YouTube write in and say, how do you stop a child from pooping in the pool when he's eight years old and has had potty training from professional teachers? Because, um, yeah, the poop in the pool, other people start to get mad at you. It's a thing that is not, uh, it's, it's not something we want to let keep happening. So, Sue, um, and again, folks, you know, I want to re remind you that she can only answer these questions from a general nature. And if you're still watching, she may have some questions for you um, on YouTube to, um, to help her better answer the question. So, um, I'd say one of the things that you definitely want to look at, though, is what is, uh, what is it about the pool, maybe, that could be triggering his or your your child's bowel movements in the pool i mean i know that for some clients that i've seen over the years that it's the movement uh once they're moving around it loosens things up for them and allows them to pass about more easily or potentially uh the other thing to look at is what what do you do after your child has a bowel movement in the pool i mean for some families what I hear is that they might inadvertently be reinforcing their child after they have a bowel movement inappropriately. So an example was I had a family that was giving their son a bath every time he had a bowel movement, no matter where he was. So whether it be in the pool or in the living room, and he loved water. And so when we discussed this, it turned out, oh, they'd been reinforcing him for having bowel movements without realizing it. So I think also too looking at when your son does have bowel movements in the places that he is supposed to do, what's the response to that too? So it could be looking at, you know, what is it about the pool that he's having the bowel movements? And then secondly, what's potentially the consequence for having a bowel movement in the swimming pool? And then also reinforcing where he's supposed to have bowel movements or where it's appropriate to have bowel movements. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, it's hard because you don't have more information than that to go off of, but maybe that's the first thing that this family needs to look at is we talk a lot on the show, Sue, about uh -huh. the ABCs of behavior, the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence because every behavior has them. So I feel like what you just brought up is what's the antecedent before? Like what is it about the pool that's setting up this environment in which they feel like and what's the consequence? Um, so we are always worried about the behavior. As parents, we're like, what are we doing about the behavior? And I love that the behaviorists are always like, mm, not so much control over that, but you have control over the antecedents and you have control over the consequences. So maybe this parent needs to start um, keeping track of that to know what's happening so that it can be looked at to see um, you know, how we can manipulate those things so that uh, it can be changed. Um, it's hard for parents because we just only look at the actual thing and go, this is the thing that's messing up my whole life and it's messing up my kid's life. Um, and, and we don't like even just hearing you talk about that parent and saying that they were inadvertently reinforcing it. A lot of times we don't see that. I've told you before that, um, my son used to hit his head on the kitchen floor and I did not see that I was reinforcing that at all like if you'd asked me I would have told you I how, why would I reinforce hitting his head on the floor like that makes no sense I'm a smart person I was not reinforcing him hitting his head on the floor but then when people would ask me what happens when he hits his head on the floor and I would straight face say to them well I'm a good mom I don't let him hit his head on the floor so I pick him up and he's crying and I rub his head and I take him to the chair and I rock him and I give him some lemonade and maybe a cookie um and they were like yeah, do you see how that, that means that if he hits his head on the floor, he gets mommy paying attention, rubbing his head, rocking him, giving him lemonade and a cookie. And my head wasn't connecting those two things. My head was parenting. And I, I don't want my child to hit his head. And when he's hurt, I want to make him feel better. So just know that it's not a blame thing, um, parents, as, as we talk about this. But we do need to look at it very scientifically the way they do and go here's the behavior what happened right before the behavior and what happened right afterwards and then keep track of that and you will start to see patterns it's kind of crazy and you go oh i didn't mean to make it set up that when you hit your head on the floor we have a milk not milk but uh, lemonade and cookie 
party. Um, it's humbling. It's humbling when you see those things. Uh, we're almost out of time here, but I want, I just, I'm in, almost in tears. Somebody wrote in and said, hello, my son is autistic and your videos have saved his life. You know, um, thank you for writing in and saying that because um, we, we set out every day to just do our level best. And when we know that it has helped somebody in any way, shape or form, it makes our whole day. And I, I know, Sue, you, you get to work with families all the time and you get to see some of the immediate results and, and you speak to people about how reinforcing that is and how that helps you to get through all of the hard things. And, you know, doing a show, we don't always know. And when you guys write and tell us, it really makes my day and I think it makes our whole staff's day. Um, so, Sue, uh, you're amazing. Um, I... For anybody in the future that if, if somebody has any questions specifically about, because I've said well, you're the functional communication queen, uh, if people ha write in questions, can we send them to you in the future? Absolutely. Yes, please. I've been honored to answer any questions. Okay. Well, we thank you for being with us, and we thank you for all your hard work uh, over the years helping our kiddos and our families on the autism spectrum, and we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, and so we're just down here to the last minute and a half, you guys. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of heads up about stuff that's happening uh, the rest of the week. Um, so on Friday, uh, we've got Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy because that's sort of the new uh, thing. And we're going to go through the whole summer because it's May and we got to talk about summer and about some things that you guys can be doing regardless of whether you're doing a camp or you're doing, um, you know, continuing with ABA. Summer is an ideal time to catch up. So we're going to give you the whole rundown on things that parents can do to enrich the summer, to have fun and, and really get more caught up during the summer and why that's so, so super important. Uh, and then tomorrow we've got an amazing show planned for you. I'm super excited about it. And we're going to take a, I'm trying to carve out more time to answer questions that you guys have sent in because we've got a backlog of those. So we're going to take some time to do that as well. Um, I just want to thank you again and um, all of you for being a part of our family. I know it's been a little wonkinator uh, as we've gotten moved to this new format and we're still figuring it out, but thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for writing in. Of course, our goal always is to be as interactive as we possibly can. You will see that some of the shows that we'll be doing are pre-taped, um, but we're gonna try to get to those questions during the live ones that we do. Uh, because we're here for you guys, and that is, is really the long and the short of it. Uh, Traven, if you're talking to me, I've lost you. Okay, it's time to sign off. Until uh, tomorrow, give your kid a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.